Again, I want to say Happy New Year to everyone, or Happy New Year's Eve. This is the last day of 2023, so I, saw, I, I thought that it would be a good time to take a break from our, our normal, which is we're going through the Gospel of Mark, if you're a guest with us. We've been going through the Gospel of Mark for some time, so we're going to take a break from that this morning, and we're going to cover a completely different topic. So if you come back next week, there's the hook. If you come back next week, we'll pick back up in the Gospel of Mark. We've been going through that line by line. It's been so encouraging and such a wonderful blessing to be able to just read through that Gospel. It's so rich, um, but so helpful for us. Today, though, I want to talk to you about the Millennial Kingdom. And the reason for that, if you can think back, think back to 2020. So go back to about 2019, right before 2020 began. Does everybody remember that time? So going into 2020, everybody was just joyful and gleeful, right? We just had so much anticipation and excitement. There was so much going on. I remember that time, just, just such a wonderful time. We were preparing for ministry at that time. We were, we were beginning to really just work out the call of ministry in our lives, me becoming a full-time pastor uh, in ministry. But then, if you remember, January, February, March, right around and then, the whole world shut down completely. Everything came to a complete stop because of the pandemic that went global. And then, right after that, we had civil unrest in our country because of everything that took place between law enforcement and the incident that happened with George Floyd. If you think about that, though, going 2019 to 2020, it just seemed like we were all, right, just excited and, and happy, right? There's happiness there. But then all of a sudden, everything just hit rock bottom. And I don't believe that anybody went into 2020 fully prepared. So my question this morning, are we prepared for what is coming? Are we prepared for what is to come? Are we fully prepared for that? And if we begin to think around that, if we begin to think about that, going into 2024, 2024, and I'm, I'm, this is, I'm going to go out on a limb, but it's a very, very short limb. I'm going to say 2024 is going to be very challenging. And if you think about what is going to happen in our country, we have a presidential race that's ongoing. Right? We've already had debates on the Republican side. We've got a lot going on politically. In November of 2024, we're going to elect the next president of the United States of America. So think about that. Leading up to that political decision we have to make in this democratic country, leading up to that political decision, there is always divisiveness, right? Hearts are revealed. Things come out. Things become very explosive, hostile, tense, awkward. Everything that happens leading up to the election, especially thinking about the last couple of elections, everything leading up to them has been very, very yucky. Amen? We also have in our state, many other states, uh, several races for the position of governor, so gubernatorial races. In our state, our governor, our current governor, said he's not going to run again. So the next up... Attorney General Bob Ferguson, and then who's running against him? Dave Reichert. So just think about that. Things are going to get very, very heated in our state. Our state, for a long time, has been controlled by one side of the political party. I don't see that shifting. Uh, that could. It would be miraculous, in my opinion. Uh, but just think about leading up to that election, things are going to be very, very tense. Are you glad you came to church? A lot of negative, right? As we approach 2024, things are going to be challenging here in our state, here in our country, but then think globally. We still have an ongoing war in Gaza. Israel engaged in conflict there, right? We are praying for Israel, praying for those in uh, Israel and the leadership there and what's going on. But internally, conflict is already happening. They're thinking about, hey, should we move right now before we even resolve this conflict, should we begin to move to get Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu out of there? They're already talking about that. So are you going to have political unrest there? Russia and Ukraine still engaged in conflict. In Sudan, there is war going on that really doesn't make the news, but it is ongoing conflict. Think about China and Taiwan. China recently said 
it is inevitable that Taiwan becomes part of China. So you think politically or by military force. All of this is looking forward into the future of 2024, a challenging, challenging year. That is my prediction. That it, I'm, not, I'm not alone in that prediction. Many are saying 2024 is going to be extremely, extremely challenging. Again, my challenge question, are you prepared for what is coming? Are you prepared for what is to come? And if we start to think about that, we have to look forward or beyond that, and we have to begin to look at the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Think about his first coming. The first advent of our Lord, he says in John chapter 12, If anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. That's the essence of his first advent, his first coming. The one who rejects me and doesn't receive my, my sayings has this as his judge. Here it is. The word, Jesus says, I have spoken, will judge him on the last day. So when we begin to look forward past 2024, maybe during 2024, we don't know. Maybe before the end of this day. We start to anticipate and look forward to and we are alert for the return of our Lord and Savior. He came during his first advent to save the world, right? He gave his life. He laid his life down on a cross. He went to the grave that should have been yours and it should have been mine. He was resurrected. He was raised from the dead on the third day. And he is the provider of eternal life for this world. Amen? When he comes back, he will still be the savior of this world. But he will do that through judgment. He will judge this world by the words that he has spoken. He will judge this world. He will remove every single person who rejects him, who defies him, who is oppositional to him and says no to him. And then he will begin to rule and reign here on this earth, ushering in or bringing in his millennial kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ. Are you prepared for what is to come. There's no slides on the screen this morning. And the reason is, I want us to take notes. I want us to be in the Word of God. This is all about the Millennial Kingdom, so we're going to walk as systematically as we can through Scripture, and I want to show you several things. Okay, we're going to look at the here and now, right? What time is it right now? What, what are we currently what, what age is it or what time or season is it currently according to God's word? What's next? What is to come? And then I want to look at the benefits of the millennial kingdom this morning and ultimately we'll close with this, the purpose of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ here on this earth. It's a great, great study, but the reason I didn't do notes, I want to give Kylie a break so she can actually be involved in the study as well. If you didn't know that, Kylie does slides. She does the slides every week for worship, for the sermons. If you want to be involved in clicking that, it's, it's a great opportunity to serve. You can go talk to her after the service. It takes a lot of effort, though, because during the service, you have to sit there and follow along instead of getting into your Bible and taking notes and being able to receive the word that, that is being taught. So a good time today to take a break from slides. Forgive me. There's only one slide. It's the graphic slide. That's all you get. Take notes. If you have questions, Jeremy, I don't know if I'm going to do this. Man, if you have questions at the end... We might open it up to questions. We'll see how it goes. I can barely see the clock. We'll see what happens. All right? But let's pray, um, and then we're, we're going to jump right into Scripture. God, thank you so much for your word. There is a lot that is coming. We know that. 2024, we believe that, is going to be challenging. But God, we can stop right now and remind each other that you are sovereign, that you are in control, that you have everything in your capable, perfect hand. 
So we don't need to worry about anything. We don't need to move into this next year, this new year, this election cycle that's coming here. We don't need to move into this with fear and trepidation. God, we can just move into this time with eyes wide open, with our heads up, being alert, being watchful, being ready. God, we can be um, eagerly anticipating what you're going to do. And you're still working, you're still working here in Renewed Life Church. You've, you've established this local church here, God, in this community to work in and through this place and through the people that are represented here. So, Father God, we just thank you for that. Uh, we are just overjoyed by that, to be used by you in this way, instruments of yours in this world. So, Father, help us to really just understand this topic this morning, God, to be able to explore this, to be able to be excited about this, to get into your word, to know what is coming um, with a biblical reality. Father, help us to shape that this morning. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. What we're going to do is, I'm going to shape this for you this morning. Where, where are we at now? So the here and the now. What time is it now? And I always say what time it is. But just thinking about what time it is now. What season are we in? And to go to Isaiah 9, these are the, the, the Bible verses that are found on most Christmas cards, right? Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. Let me read this for you. It says, For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us. And that is prophetically fulfilled, right, through Jesus the Messiah. And the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast. So talking about the government, the system of government that will be on his shoulders, the dominion will be vast, its prosperity will never end, and he will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. So if you, we think back to the first coming of Jesus, right? A child will be born a son will be given that is accomplished through Jesus the Messiah. And what did his disciples, what do other Israelites, Jewish people at that time, what did they want him to do? They wanted him to fulfill all of this. They wanted the government to be on his shoulders right then and there. They wanted him to forcefully kick out the Romans, take over, start ruling and reigning here on earth. Right now, let's go, let's do this. And he said, no, first... The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected and be killed, and rise again on the third day. Hey, things need to be accomplished first, and then this will happen. The government will be on his shoulders. His dominion will be vast. Its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David physically from this earth in Jerusalem forever. Amen? We're looking forward to that. Turn to Acts chapter 1. If you can't tell, I get excited when we talk about eschatology. Folks, the reason that I get so excited about this, and I'll just drop little things here and there, I don't put my faith and trust in any political system. I don't put my faith and trust in any politician. I think we're so far beyond that. When we really pray for or call for peace on this earth, when we call for righteousness, when we call for justice, when we call for using the progressive words against them, equality and all these things, we're really calling for the return of Jesus Christ. We're really calling for him to come and kick out all the opposition and begin to rule and reign perfectly from this earth. That's going to be amazing. That's why I get so excited about it. Acts chapter 1, though, what time is it now? Where are we at now? The times and the seasons that are in the Father's hands, where are we at now on that timeline? Acts chapter 1, and look at verse number 6. 
It says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? Great question. Is it time for Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 to be fulfilled? Is the government going to be on your shoulders? Are you going to start ruling and reigning here from Jerusalem? Is it time for the kingdom to be restored to Israel? What did Jesus say? Verse 7, he said to them, it's not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. Here's what time it is. But you, verse 8, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that's what time it is right now. That's where we're at right now. Right now is for the proclamation of the gospel to go to the ends of the earth. The Great Commission. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all the things that Jesus taught us. Observe or obey is another way of saying that. And he says, I will be with you until the end of the age. So that time or that period is going to be established and controlled by God the Father. And he will tell us when that time is over. But for now... We are in the time of the Great Commission. Sometimes we call this the church age or the age of the Gentiles. This is the time the gospel goes out starting in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, Judea, all Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we start to see this in Acts chapter 2, right? The Holy Spirit comes upon them and enables them to speak in tongues that, that miraculous gift happens there. Many people, Jewish people, begin to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And the church that Jesus says, I will build, the gates of Hades will not come against it. The church is being built starting in Acts chapter 2 and on. That's what time it is right now. That's where we're at on the timeline. And what are we waiting for? What is next? The next event prophetically in scripture that has to take place is the rapture of the church. So that is a prophetic event that will take place and that is not attached to anything else. Meaning nothing has to happen for that to take place. That is an imminent event, meaning it can happen at any time. I understand, though, there are different viewpoints on when the rapture will take place. There's four different ones. We have pre-tribulational rapture. We have mid-tribulation rapture, post-trib rapture, and a pre-wrath rapture. There's four different views. There are four different ways of looking at the rapture of the church. Turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. So if we understand there are four different ways to look at the rapture of the church, we can understand as good human beings there are four different ways to argue and really just get it and debate and do all these things, which is fine. This morning is not about which rapture doctrine, opinion, or belief is correct, which is pre-trib, but it's not about that. So we can argue that at a later time. That's fine. The reason that I say I am a pre-trib rapture believer is because I want you to know how I will preach the Bible. I want you to know how I will approach texts found in the Bible, And that's important for us to know. But this morning is not about arguing which four. But I will say this, John 14, 1 through 3 says there's a rapture of the church. If you do not believe there is a rapture, then you have to cut these three verses out of your Bible. John 14, 1 through 3, Jesus says, Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so... Would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, so that's the reality, Jesus says, I will come again, and look at this, take you to myself so that where I am, and where is he? He is seated at the right hand of the Father, so that where I am, you may also be. So if we start to understand there is a rapture of the church, 
And we know that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. We know that's his current place. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that. He is the exact expression of the Father. And he, after accomplishing the will and the work of the Father here on earth, ascended and is seated now at the right hand of the Father. That's what Hebrews chapter 1 tells us. So we know that's where he is. And he says here, if I go, my Father's house, there's many rooms. If I go and prepare a place for you, that's the reality. That's where he is. I will come again and take you to myself so that you can be where I am also. Where is he? He's in heaven. So that's where we would be going. We would be going to heaven with him for a certain amount of time. And that, that amount of time is a seven year, and we call this the tribulation here on earth. This is also called the 70th week of Daniel, Daniel 9, 27, right? He, that is speaking of the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with many for one week. That is the final week, the final seven-year period. That's known as the 70th week of Daniel. It's also known in Jeremiah 30, verse number 7, a time of Jacob's trouble. So those are the biblical names for that seven-year period of time on earth where God is going to begin to pour out his wrath, his indignation. He is going to begin to judge those who stand in opposition, who say no thank you to Jesus Christ. That's a seven-year period of time. I believe the rapture of the church takes place right before that event. And then the Antichrist makes a firm covenant with Israel for one week, that seven-year period of time. In the middle of that week, he enters the temple. He interrupts or puts a stop to sacrifice and offering. And he sets up the abomination of desolation on a wing of the temple. And Jesus speaks about this in the Olivet Discourse. That's a seven-year period of time on earth when God will once again turn his attention toward the Jewish people and he will judge every single person that also includes Jewish people who turn against him and defy him and reject him. There's a lot that is accomplished during that seven-year period of time to include amazing things that are happening in heaven. And if we think about Daniel chapter 7 or Psalms chapter 2, we start to understand that God is going to give dominion to the Son, Jesus, and he will begin to rule and reign. When we look at, if you want to, go to Revelation chapter 11. When we look at the coronation ceremony of Jesus, when the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he rules forever. When we look at that event, that event will happen in heaven. Certain things will be accomplished. And then we'll look at Revelation 19 here in a second. The grand finale, and that's how I put it, the grand finale of that seven-year period of tribulation here on earth will be the return of Jesus the Messiah to this earth. He will accomplish through judgment everything that he needs to accomplish, and then he will establish his rule and reign. So let's look at this, though, first. Revelation chapter 11, verse number 15, says, The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The 24 elders who were seated before God on their thrones fell face down and they worshiped God, saying, we give you thanks, Lord God, the Almighty who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. The time has come for the dead to be judged and to give the reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints, and to those who fear your name, both small and great. And the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. 
The temple of God in heaven was open. The ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, and earthquake and severe hail. So right there, that is what I call the coronation ceremony of Jesus Christ there in heaven. Again, the reason that I believe a pre-trib rapture of the church is because I believe we, followers of Jesus Christ, who are in Christ, I believe we will be present for this most glorious ceremony in heaven, worshiping Jesus as he takes his great power and begins to reign. The kingdom of our world, this earth, will become his kingdom and he will begin to rule and reign. Several things happen. Skip over to Revelation chapter 19. Several things happen right before Jesus comes back physically. As you're turning to Revelation 19, I want you to think about this. Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells them, hey, you are going to remain or stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You receive power. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in all Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then what happened? He ascended. They were watching him ascend. And as they're watching him ascend, two angels dressed in white appeared to them. And they said, why are you standing here looking up in heaven? Why are you watching this event? If you think about this, what they said is, hey, you're watching this event. He's going to come back. He's going to return in the same way that you just watched him ascend. He will descend in the same way and come back to the same place. That's what we're waiting for. Revelation 19. I'm sorry, that's not what we are waiting for. I'm waiting for Jesus to appear in the sky. I saw some looks. And he is going to rapture the church. We are going to meet him in the air. Those who are dead in Christ, we will meet them. We will be reunited with them in the air. Finally seeing Jesus face to face and being reunited with those who have died in Christ before us. Amen? And then we will be in heaven for this most wonderful coronation ceremony. All of these events that are taking place. That's what I believe. And then Revelation 19, we will be with Christ during this event where he comes back plants his feet on the Mount of Olives, and a whole bunch of things happen. Revelation 19, though, verse number 11, it says, Then I saw heaven opened, right? Remember when there is, Jesus is ascending, heaven opens, and they see. And then they said, hey, he's going to come back in the same way. Then I saw, John says, heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Remember, he says when he comes back, what will judge people? The words I have spoken will judge them on the last day. And his name here, the Word of God. Verse 14, the armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. I believe that's us. That's us coming back with Jesus. Verse number 15, a sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh. King of kings and Lord of lords. Isaiah 11.4 says he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. So when we understand that, when he comes back again, he is still the Savior. Many people say this. During his first advent, he came to save the world. He is the Savior. And the next coming, in his, in his second coming, he's not coming back as the Savior. He's coming back as the judge. He's still the Savior of the world. He has to judge to be the perfect, righteous, wonderful Savior that he is. He has to stand in judgment. And it says the words from his mouth, he will judge them by the words that he has spoken. So Isaiah 11.4 says he will kill the wicked by a word from his mouth. That's all he has to do. That is the grand finale. That is the event that 
ends that seven years of tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble here on this earth, when Jesus returns, Zechariah 14, to the Mount of Olives, we'll read that in a minute, when he returns to the Mount of Olives, he kills the wicked with a word from his mouth, He begins to establish his rule and reign here on earth, and he ushers in or begins the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ here on this earth from Jerusalem. Let's keep going. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 1. Now we're going to talk about, so, so we understand what time it is right now. We are in the church age or the age of the Gentiles. The Great Commission is going out. Amen? We are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are wanting to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ, to accept who he is, to believe in him, to choose to receive eternal life from him. What's next, though, what is coming, what we are waiting for, that imminent event is the rapture of the church and the seven-year tribulation here on earth. Whatever order you want to put that in, that's fine. I believe in the pre-tribulational rapture of the church, and then that event takes place. The grand finale of that event is Jesus Christ coming back, Revelation 19, planting his feet on the Mount of Olives, uh, killing the wicked with a word from his mouth. He's beginning to establish his rule and reign here on the earth. So here's what's coming. Here's what's what that is going to look like. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 1. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, the ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So the first benefit that we see during the thousand-year reign of Christ is that Satan is bound in the abyss during this entire time. Amen? Praise the Lord. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing to look forward to. Notice, though, as we keep going, there is still the curse of sin on this world. Even in this perfect environment where Satan is bound for a thousand years, defiance and rebellion creeps in. Look at verse number three. He threw him, that is Satan, into the abyss, closed it, put a seal on it, so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. Notice there it says nations, plural. He would would deceive the nations when? When the thousand years are over. After that, he must be released for a short time. Verse 4, then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So the event that we're waiting for, that event that takes place there, is Jesus begins to rule and reign here on the earth, There are thrones, people seated on them, who were given authority to judge. Those who are beheaded, those who are killed for their testimony, for their followership and devotion and loyalty to Jesus Christ during that time of tribulation, during the 70th week of Daniel, the the time of Jacob's trouble, those who give their lives to Jesus Christ to accept him during that time and are killed during that time are also resurrected right then, And they are given authority as well. So we will rule and reign with Jesus Christ here on this earth. Every one of us. Notice there are nations and we still have work here to be done. Why? Because Jesus is going to establish his rule and authority here on earth. His word will go out. He will have to continue to 
establish his authority during that time, and we will work on his behalf. So there's going to be work to be done. It's going to be fun. Go back to Matthew 19. We'll make our way back to the Old Testament. But Matthew 19, I wanted to show you this. As Jesus actually taught this to the disciples, what we just talked about is thrones being established, people ruling and reigning. Jesus taught this to his disciples. Matthew 19, verse 28. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, in the renewal of all things. That's an interesting way to put it, right? In the renewal of all things. Talk about a remodeling. Talk about restoration, right? Talk about him ruling and reigning here on earth. Think about perfect government. Satan being bound in the abyss. Glorified saints. Ruling and reigning with him. Being given jobs to do. That is the renewal of all things that he is talking about. When the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne there, you who have followed me, he says, will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jesus begins to establish this teaching for them. Hey, guys, you're going to have jobs to do. There are going to be nations. There's going to be 12 tribes of Israel. That is going to be a nation. He's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. There's going to be a need for a system of government that he will establish here on this earth. And it's going to be perfect. It's going to be amazing. He will arbitrate. He will mediate. He will do different things to begin to carry out justice and righteousness on this earth. And it's going to be amazing. Go back to Zechariah chapter 14. So if you skip back. Keep going left in your Bible past Malachi, Zechariah 14, Malachi, Zechariah 14, we're going to start to get into what is the millennial kingdom going to look like? What are the benefits of this? So if we think about the benefits of Jesus Christ, I mean... You begin to wrap your head around this, Jesus Christ physically returning to this earth. Remember his disciples are asking him before he ascends, is it time for the kingdom to be restored to Israel? Is it time for you to rule and reign? Is it time for your dominion to be vast, the government to be on your shoulders? Is it time for this to happen? So when Jesus begins to establish his rule and reign here on earth, his kingdom when he begins to establish his system of government, there are going to be benefits beyond benefit there at that time. We're going to start to look at some of these in Scripture, and we're going to start to point some of these out, which is a, complete, a completely different time for us. And we can't really understand or wrap our heads around it, but things are going to be different. different. Look at this, Zechariah chapter 14, verse number 8. On that day... Living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it toward the east, the other half toward the western sea, in summer and winter alike. On that day, the Lord will become king over the whole earth, the Lord alone and his name alone. All the land from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem, will be changed into a plain. So there are physical things that are going to happen. Think about when Jesus returns when he plants his feet on the Mount of Olives, when the Mount of Olives is split to the north and to the south, a great valley is produced there. There are physically different things that are going to happen here on earth. Jesus is going to change physically the face of this earth. It's going to be different. It's going to look different. And right here it says, Jerusalem will be raised up and will remain on its site from the Benjamin Gate to the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the royal wine press. People will live there and never again will there be a curse of complete destruction so Jerusalem will dwell in security. And if you keep reading there, he talks about the plagues coming against those who oppose him. But if you skip down to verse 16, then all the survivors from the nations 
that came against Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of armies, and to celebrate the festival of shelters. Let's rip that apart real quick. All of the survivors who come from the nations who came against Jerusalem. So think about this. World leaders leading nations will come against. Actually, the Bible says they are brought against Jerusalem, right? Those nations, those leaders bring those nations against Jerusalem and Jesus fights them, destroys them, and kills them, remember, by a word from his mouth. People who are from those nations who have accepted Jesus as Messiah during that time, have believed in his name, will go into the millennial kingdom. They will live through that event. They will survive that event. They will go into the millennial kingdom and they will have an opportunity while we are ruling and reigning different jobs, different functions with Jesus, they will have an opportunity to begin to worship him. Everybody that goes into the millennial kingdom are saved. They are born again, followers of Jesus Christ. So it's survivors from those nations represented that came against Jerusalem. Verse 17, should any of the families of the earth not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of armies, rain will not fall on them. And if the people of Egypt will not go up and enter, the rain will not fall on them. This will be the plague the Lord inflicts on the nations who do not go up to celebrate the festival of shelters. This will be the punishment of Egypt and all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the festival of shelters. So if we think about this, saved people, born again people, followers of Jesus, survivors of that time of tribulation, enter the millennial kingdom, and they begin to reproduce and populate the earth, their children have to grow up, hear about, and accept who Jesus is as Messiah. Remember, Satan is bound in the abyss during this time. Right now, he walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, right? We understand that. We understand the hostility, the spiritual battle that is ongoing because of Satan and because of his followers. During this time, this millennial reign, he is bound in the abyss, but there are still those who grow up in the, in the sinful nature, who are born into sinful flesh, who have to hear the gospel and accept who Christ is. And it says here that there are those who will choose willfully to defy, to rebel. And there will be plagues, no rain, drought that comes on those people. These are the same people who are living in hostility to Jesus during the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. They're living in hostility and opposition and rebellion to him, but they're just keeping it all under wraps. And when Satan is released, From the abyss, for a time, he deceives nations. Who is he deceiving? These people who are growing up in the millennial kingdom who are saying no to Jesus. And it says in Revelation 20 that they will be consumed by fire. So there are still those who choose even during this perfect reign of Jesus Christ where Satan is bound in the abyss, there are those who will choose to defy Jesus Christ. That's an amazing thought when we start to wrap our heads around it. Because we always say, Satan made me do it. Right? We always say, he did this. Jesus is going to remove him from this earth take away any dominion that he has for a thousand years and people will still sin against Jesus. They will still refuse him. That's the amazing part about this. Scary part. Devastating, heartbreaking part of this. Go back to Zephaniah chapter 3. Just a few pages back in your Bible. Zephaniah chapter 3.
starting in verse number 8. It says, therefore, wait for me, this is the Lord's declaration, until the day I rise up for plunder. For my decision is to gather nations, we already talked about that, to assemble kingdoms in order to pour out my indignation on them. All my burning anger for the whole earth will be consumed by the fire of my jealousy. For I will then restore pure speech to the people so that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him with a single purpose. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my supplicants, my dispersed people, will bring an offering to me. On that day, you will not be put to shame because of everything you have done in rebelling against me. For then, I will remove from among you your jubilant, arrogant people, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. I will leave a meek and humble people among you, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. Who are these people? Verse 13, the remnant of Israel will no longer do wrong or tell lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will pasture and lie down with nothing to make them afraid. Sing for joy, daughter Zion. Shout loudly, Israel. Be glad and celebrate with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has removed your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord, look at this, is among you. You need no longer fear harm. On that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. I will gather those who have been driven from the appointed festivals It will be a tribute from you and a a reproach on her. Yes, at that time I will deal with all who oppress you. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will make those who are disgraced throughout the earth receive praise and fame. At that time I will bring you back. Yes, at that time I will gather you. I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes. The Lord has spoken. One of the major benefits, don't miss this. This is a, you're going to say this, duh. A major benefit of the millennial kingdom, Jesus, the Lord, is among us. And he is ruling and reigning, it says right here, to the Israelites from Jerusalem. Go back to Micah chapter 4. Micah chapter 4. Think about Jesus ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, right? Think about Jesus being among us. Think about the wicked, those who have opposed Jesus Christ, those who have denied him being killed by a word from his mouth when he rises up to pour out his anger and indignation on this earth, and he removes them. Satan is bound for a thousand years in the abyss. Jesus begins to rule and reign from Jerusalem. He is among us. Look at what the the ongoing benefits are of his 1,000-year reign here on this earth. Micah chapter 4, look at verse 1. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. People will stream to it. And many nations will come and say, come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, of the God of Jacob. He will teach us about his ways so we may walk in his paths. For instruction will go out of Zion. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will settle disputes among many peoples and provide arbitration for strong nations that are far away. How's he going to do that? Through those he has appointed to rule and reign with him. Ultimately, he's the ultimate arbiter, right? We have a dispute among the nations you can't settle. What do you get to go to? The perfect ruler, the righteous leader of this world, you get to go right to Jerusalem and present your case to Jesus the Christ and he will resolve it for you. Isn't that wonderful? He will settle disputes among many peoples, provide arbitration for strong nations that are far away. They will beat their swords into plows. 
and their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not take up sword against nation, and they will never again train for war. Military systems are crumbled, dismantled, taken apart. You think about nuclear stockpiles. Maybe they're already expended at this point, right? We can have some theories and some discussions about that. But all of that's gone, right? There's a time when all of weapons are going to be destroyed, done away with. Why? Because there's no more reason to train for war. Why? Nation will not raise up against nation. And the system of government that Jesus is going to lead here on this earth, there will be no more war. Amen? Verse 4, each person will sit under his grapevine and under his fig tree with no one to frighten him. I think in our modern day context, that could mean you can leave your doors open, unlocked again. No one's going to come and steal your stuff and plunder your house. You're not going to work exhaustively for something and somebody come in and steal it. You get to enjoy what you work for. Isn't that awesome? Though all the peoples walk in the name of their own gods, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. On that day, this is the Lord's declaration, I will assemble the lame and gather the scattered, those I have injured. Underline that, those I have injured, he says. I will make the lame into a remnant, those far removed into a strong nation. Speaking of Israel, then the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time on and forever. And you, watchtower for the flock, fortified hill of daughter Zion, The former rule will come to you. Sovereignty will come to daughter Jerusalem. Go back to Isaiah chapter 2. This is repeated there. But it's a great passage again for us to begin to underline or circle or write down benefits of the millennial kingdom. Isaiah chapter 2. Verse number one, the vision that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. All nations will stream to it. Here, I want to point this out. We just read from the book of Micah, right? The prophet Micah. Now we're reading in Isaiah. When two different prophets at two different times speak the same message given to them by God, We better listen, amen? And it says here, all nations will stream to it, verse number three, and many peoples will come and say, come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of of the God of Jacob. He will teach us about his ways so that we may walk in his paths. For instruction will go out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will settle disputes among the nations and provide arbitration for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plows, their spears into pruning knives. Nation, again, will not take up sword against nation and they will never again train for war. Did you notice there the instruction will go out? The word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Think about this world being filled with the word of God. The word is being proclaimed right now. For those who have eyes to see, ears to hear, right? Hearts that are open. The word is being proclaimed right now. But many refuse the word of the Lord, the instruction coming from the mouth of Jesus will go out from Zion, the word from Jerusalem, into all the earth. And his word will be what is in control. It will be the authoritative word that goes out that everyone will submit to and listen to. Turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 1, Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Speaking of Jesus, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. 
He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears. Why? The Lord examines the mind, right? Remember this? He examines the mind and he tests the heart. But he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed. Verse 4. He will strike the land with a scepter from his mouth and he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. That's Revelation 19 right there. Righteousness will be a belt around his hips. Faithfulness will be a belt around his waist. The wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf will be together and a child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young ones will lie down together and the lion will will eat straw like cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit, and a toddler will put his hand into a snake's den. They will not harm or destroy each other on my entire holy mountain, for the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. Think about this. When, when Noah got off the ark, God began to speak to Noah he told him to go out, to fill the earth, to multiply, be fruitful. And then he began to explain to him, hey, the animals are going to fear you. There's going to be a different dynamic. And you will eat animals. Animals will no longer just eat straw and be herbivores. They will become, many of them, carnivorous. They will become predatory when Jesus comes back and rules and reigns, that is again reversed. And we go back to that Garden of Eden-like state where kids will be able to play with cobras if parents want them to. <laughs> Lions will be eating straw. Bears and cows will graze together. It's going to be a different world that we see, that we experience. Because of the rule and reign of Jesus Christ here on this earth, he's going to do things differently, and we're going to have a different dynamic. It's just going to be so amazing. And the, the benefit, verse 9, don't miss this. The land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. How much is the sea filled with water? 100%, right? We'd have to just stop there. It's 100%. I used to do this in the military, you know, hey, you know, Sergeant, I'm going to give 110% today. That's, it's impossible. You can only give 100%. That's the max. 100%. The water is filled with the sea, 100%. That's, this world will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Everything will know him. Creation will know him. The animals will know him. Everything will be restored. The renewal of all things is happening because of him. Isaiah 65, keep going. We're almost done, believe it or not. Isaiah 65, starting in verse 17. This is an exhaustive topic, by the way, the millennial kingdom. There's so much more in Scripture. There's so much more in Isaiah. There's so much more to discuss about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ here on this earth. You go to the book of Psalms, there's many Psalms that speak of this time, the Lord being king on Zion, all of this prophetically speaking of this time. This is an exhaustive topic. My point is this, we can't quite cover possibly everything to do with the millennial kingdom. So we're just going to cover a couple of more things and then we're done. Isaiah 65, look at verse 17, for I will create new heavens and a new earth. The past events will not be remembered or come to mind. Then be glad and rejoice forever for what are in what I am creating. For I will create Ju Jerusalem to be a joy and its people to be a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will no longer be heard in her. Remember, she just went through something very, very tremendously detrimental. The sound of weeping and crying will no longer be heard in her, speaking of Jerusalem specifically, in her a nursing infant will no longer live only a few days or an old man not live out his days. Indeed, 
the one who dies at a hundred years old will be mourned as a young man. And the one who misses a hundred years will be considered cursed. People will build houses and live in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build houses and others live in them. Right? They will not plant and others eat. For my people's lives will be like the lifetime of a tree. My chosen ones will fully enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor without success or bear children destined for disaster. For they, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord along with their descendants. Even before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like cattle, but the serpent's food will be dust. That, that curse, remember, go back to Genesis 3. Think, think about that. The serpent's food will still be dust. The curse is not removed yet. When God addressed the serpent, he said what? You're going to eat dust for the rest of your days. That curse is not removed yet. So, so we're made sure to be told of, about this through the prophet Isaiah here. That the serpent's food will be dust. That will continue. They will not do what is evil or destroy on my entire holy mountain, says the Lord. Again, we look at the animal kingdom being different, being restored. There's a, there's a different uh, interaction, a dynamic between human beings and animals during this time. But we also notice life will be different. Those who survive and who reproduce and populate and fill the earth during the millennial reign, a thousand years, think about how big the population uh, can extend to or grow to during a thousand year reign of Christ. People who are going into that and living during that time, remember, we will be in a different glorified state. People who are alive during the millennial kingdom who are born into that, who begin to grow up in that, will live longer lives. If they only live 100 years, we will say, wow, that is a curse. That's bad luck. Because life will be extended during that time. I want to look at this as the purpose, the final purpose here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's look at the final purpose of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. First Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse 24. It says, Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and authority and power, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be ab abolished is death. Turn to Revelation chapter 20, I'll show you this. The last enemy to be abolished is death. Remember, he must rule and reign until all his enemies are put under his feet. He reigns for a thousand years, and then once again, a rebellion rises up, right? It sounds like a Star Wars movie, but this is biblical reality. Satan will be released for a time. He will deceive nations. They will come against Jesus surrounding that city, he consumes them with fire from above, finally putting all of his enemies under his feet. And then he goes on to abolish death. The whole purpose of the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ is so that he rules and reigns until his enemies are finally put under his feet completely and death is no more. Revelation chapter 20, look at verse 7. It says, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and he will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They came up across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are. 
The beast and the false prophet, they've been there for a thousand years. They're the sole occupants of the lake of fire. Now Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse number 11, it says, Then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it, earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. Then the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each one was judged according to their works. Why are they judged according to their works? Because their names are not written in the book of life. When your name is not written in the book of life, when you do not accept who Jesus is, when you do not call on his name for salvation, for forgiveness of sins, When you are not born again, saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, you will stand in judgment by your works. I don't know about you. I don't know about me. I don't want to be judged by my works. Amen? I know my works. Those whose names are not written in the book of life are judged according to their works. If you think about this too, this is God's grace. How many people have you heard in your lifetime say, I'm good. I'll do enough good works to overcome the bad works in my life so that he, God, will accept me. And God says, okay, let's prove this out. Each one was judged according to their works. Verse 14, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the finality of that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ here on this earth. This is the whole purpose, right? He rules until his enemies are are made completely his footstool under his feet, and death is abolished. Think about the false prophet. You think about the Antichrist being in the lake of fire. At the end of this thousand-year reign, Satan is released for a time, and Jesus deals with him. And then he's thrown into the lake of fire. And then everybody whose name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life, who's not in Christ, who's not born again, who is not saved, stands in judgment. They are judged according to their works. And the result there, the reality is, no one will pass that judgment. No one will surpass that. No one will be able to successfully go through that. And the reality is, if your name is not written in the book of life, no matter how many works, good or bad, you've done, you will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's the end of the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. And then a new heaven, new earth. No more crying, no more grieving, no more mourning, no more pain, no more sorrow. And then the curse of sin is removed. And I don't know about you, but when I begin to approach 2024, knowing it's going to be a challenging year, I'm looking forward to meeting Jesus in the air. I'm looking forward to being reunited with people who have died in Christ, who are with him right now. I'm looking forward to worshiping at his feet. I'm looking forward to taking crowns that he has given me off my head and throwing them at his feet. I'm looking forward to watching the kingdom of this world become his kingdom and him beginning to rule and reign. I'm looking forward to him coming back and removing every person who opposes him. And I'm looking forward to him ruling and reigning from this earth to establish his kingdom, his perfect system. So I can look at 2024, which happens in just a few hours. It's happening in other parts of the world already. They've already turned that calendar. 
I can approach this and know, yes, we are going to face some things this year, I believe, that are going to be difficult, that are going to be challenging. But know this, folks. Everything that is being done is in the hands of our perfect, capable, merciful, loving God. And he's going to accomplish his perfect will and purpose for this planet. What do we have right now? We have time to say yes to Jesus. We have time to call on his name. We have time to share the love of Jesus Christ with those that we love, that we are put in relationship with. Are you ready for what is to come? That's my challenge. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you looking forward to that? Are you prepared for what's coming here physically on this earth before Jesus comes back and takes us to be with him where he is? Because there's a lot that we have to rely on him. We have to come together and count on one another. I know the clock is ticking, ticking, ticking. Father God, thank you so much for this. We thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. God, your compassion. God, we thank you that you have put these things in your word so that we can go to them, we can study them, and we can get excited about what is to come. It is totally unreal to us. I don't think we can fully wrap our heads around it. Jesus, that you will come. We will, we will see you face to face. We will watch as you begin to rule by your great power. We will watch as you establish your perfect, righteous government here on this earth. We will be given jobs to do. And Jesus, we have so much to look forward to. Your word will go out and fill this world. We can come to you and learn from you. We can walk with you and talk with you. God, there's so much to look forward to. Thank you for encouraging us now through your word. Accept this song now in Jesus' name, amen.